listening tonight I got a feeling that the cards just ain't right I'm so salty, must not give in to rage And I'm wondering what those rollers will say Scarves to the left of me, but cheers to the right Here I am, gonna roll a derby tonight Gonna roll a derby tonight Gonna roll a derby tonight. G'day everybody and welcome to another edition of the Hidden City Roller Derby. I am Simkoff and I'm here with, as usual, the motley crew of other bowlers. We have uh, Butters, how's it going? Good, good. Super psyched. Keen for some cards. Um, how, how is Western Australia? It's good. We've got our, our Season 2 Store Championship finale this Sunday, so we're looking forward to that. It's going to be good. It's got all the big kits and the mats and stuff. Cool. And uh, just in time to not be able to vote by about three months. Uh, but <laughs> you're here. Tori Dori. <laughs> it's so fucking sad. <laughs> um, uh, We're doing season two tournaments over here, man. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm uh, feeling great. I just actually have played more L5R in the last day or two than I have in probably a month. So that's pretty fun. Yeah, that is, that's great to hear. Um, yeah, I, th- I feel like there is a bit of a resurgence in energy with the community as we're starting to get closer and closer to Children of the uh, Empire. It's like, as of recording, it's like a week away. So it's so, so exciting. So I can't wait for that to happen. Yeah, I'm taking out that box to dinner for Valentine's Day. I'm going to make sweet love to that Children of the Empire box. <laughs> Just saying to any any of the people out there with an L5R based relationship that it is in time for a Valentine's Day gift that box just throw it out there into the ether <laughs> that is true anyone no, that is I'll not in a relationship I am available to send <laughs> gifts to if you would like to post them just... yeah if you're really into true romance poetry and stuff then that's the the gift for you for sure yeah. 1-800-BUTTERS BUTTERS Nathan is live now waiting to receive your children of the emperor 1-800 that card ain't bad Right. <laughs> yeah, so um, pretty, pretty exciting, uh, that coming up. Uh, there is a bit of an elephant in the room that we might as well get away with, uh, get over with uh, to begin with, which is uh, the OP changes. There were some changes to the way that the uh, organized play, or the, I guess the sanctioned tournament for the sad, ultra-competitive no-lifers that are in the room and, and, and listening. No doubt we are some of them, and there are probably some people in cars, on, on bicycles, maybe going for a jog. Actually, let's be real. You're probably not going for a jog, <laughs> but you are. <laughs> but you're, but you're, you're at least you're at least in the car in the the Burger King car park listening to us. Um, and shout out to you if you are. Um, but those changes are happening. We need to talk about it. Everyone else has talked about it. We're going to try to not spend half an hour talking about it and try to not make it too polarizing. But I think it is important that as uh, folk in the community, we express our opinions like assholes. We've got them, and everyone um, else we're going to do now the- knows what the changes are including me who never reads the articles just the headlines so we're just going to skim this stuff and and give a we're going to do the two second abridged version (laughs) just in case you only listen to hidden city rollers and you don't read uh, the fft news in which case you're my favorite person in the world uh hi wife um (laughs) so (laughs) um so those changes very very quickly uh that two major things one is that uh all FFG games, so this is Keyforge, Game of Thrones, Cthulhu, I don't know what the other games are, there are some other games that aren't called Legend of the Five Rings, they are moving towards a standardized structure, so we will have uh, prime events, I think they call it prime formal, but essentially we have like continental championships, national championships, regional championships and stores, store-based events. Um, the good thing about that is that we now have like a, I guess, a, a beacon for these people, we'll, we'll actually get into the, 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 the pros and cons in a second, but I guess the major thing is that there's like now an avenue for competitive players and then we also have what was announced there's going to be smaller um little i guess reinforcement type packs that get sent out to stores which are essentially for casuals so to get the promos uh, you just go in you don't actually have to play a competitive tournament you go into your local store you play some casual games and then you get some promos which are going to be separate set of promos to the tournament promos that in the l5r land we've most recently seen with your stronghold kits cotes so this is replacing right. the kits right i think ffg maybe yeah. has realized yeah. that everyone's got about 27 um play mats by now and so they can reduce the cost of the kits for the for the stores which is pretty sweet yeah 
So the other major change that has happened, um, which has caused much consternation in the community, one might say, is that we now have the challenge is that for qualifying for Worlds, Worlds has qualification associated with it now. It never used to. Well, and when I say it never used to, there's been two Worlds so far, and both of those Worlds were open events. Anybody could come to attend the World Championships. Now, the specific tournament, which is theoretically called Worlds, um, is invite only uh, and there's a complex set of ways that you can get invites you can win an elemental championship you can get like top eight in a code or top 16 well top eight in a national event and top 16 in a continental event i think there's had a motos maybe get it um but there's there's a few ways of getting it but the point is that if you're like some you know shit casual player who can't win a game you know so if you're me then you're going to struggle to get a world's invite and you'll need to figure out a way to, to another way to get there yeah, you pay, uh, so you there pay are some Neil, pros- you know 20 bucks to concede to you and then you get to go yeah so let's um without further ado the way we're going to do this a little bit different to the other podcast is we're going to say hey toridori aka bert you're going to be our salt merchant and you're going to tell us how all of these changes are a really bad thing for the community and the worst thing that's happened uh since uh watch commander was printed and i'm going to (laughs) (laughs) this is the (laughs) card of the month that simkov has just got a raging heart on against he just hates this card Uh, yeah it's 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 just it is just npe bullshit but i am i am going the games aren't very eventful (laughs) when you get (laughs) 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 you're welcome welcome. (laughs) everyone listening you're free to use that (laughs) <laughs> a joke that could only be told by a dad um and then uh, and i will as the eternal optimist who has his head in the cloud and really still believes that discouraged pursuit is a fantastic card <laughs> will and, and deceptive offer uh, I'll, I'll be the person that is cheerleading and saying how you know what you got to think about it from a different perspective and you know what there's rainbows and and it's just fantastic rainbows and lollipops all right bert let's hear the song all right so uh just i'll just preface this with it's been about a week since this news landed and we did record last week and someone fucked up the recording and uh that song was me by the way (laughs) and i actually recorded this rant last week when i was a little more um heated and i've had a week to reflect on things um so i'll give you the uh the toned down version of what i did say but my my big thing is that i struggled to see the benefits in the decision Um, I think, first of all, the game is too small to have an invite-only system, in my opinion. Um, And then, presumably, the benefits are supposed to be that the event is more competitive somehow. And I'm not sure that this is actually going to end up being the result of the decision because there are going to be some very, very competitive players who otherwise would be attending who can't attend. People who are in small Mm -hmm. regions with maybe no events that can qualify them um where the nearest event might be a country or two over um and they only have maybe time and money to go to one event internationally or nas- uh, transnationally and that would have been worlds and other and now isn't and so i think we're going to have some players who don't attend now the vast majority of very very competitive players will probably still go the ones who are going to go anyway um but i just i don't think the cut is going to be fiercer I think what it will do is it'll make the first few rounds on average harder. So you're not going to have a game round one against a local from Minnesota who's playing for prize tickets. You're just going to have killers in every round, Um, which I don't know how big of a benefit that is. Like every game, at least for me, every game was tough, but I know that most players had tough games from about round two or three onwards. Um, Mm -hmm. And I really just think it's a a shame. You know what it does? It destroys the spirit of that event. And I think that if, if regardless of what other events they schedule at the Worlds, I won't be going if I don't get invited, um, period, f- for that tournament. I, I won't get, travel halfway across the world to hang out with people. I want to compete and play. And so I think it's a shame. All right. I'm going to shed some good news. 
The good news is that this is actually fantastic for the legends of the Five Rings community. And I'll tell you why. It's a little bit of a history lesson. I did hear on some other podcast uh, that they were saying that there's never, ever been any qualification for, for the World Championships or for big L5R tournaments. That's absolutely rubbish. There is a term called grinders. Those grinders uh, is not just for um, seeking companionship on a lonely Saturday night, but it's actually also for qualifying for large tournaments. Is We did have uh, for... Uh, there have been versions of Gen Con there have been I don't know about Worlds specifically as a title but I do know that the very large L5R tournaments where big storyline decisions were uh, back in Celestial Edition and there have been other editions as well um, I think Samurai I'm not exactly sure but I know there's definitely been this concept where you go to these big tournaments and to qualify they used to have you know the ex-top players through you had to win a Kote to get an invite to go and play and then the other way to do it is throughout the weekend um, throughout these big these big conventions is you could go and play these 32 player 64 player grinders they're like five rounds four round grinders I can't you know I, I wasn't there but I've been I remember vividly reading forums as people are posting their progress in these grinders and if you want one of these grinders you then got an invite so they might run you know like a dozen of these grinders over the first couple of days and you could get an invite well, to go in Worlds and NC Worlds was be, right? NC that's how he got his nickname yeah he used to go to those Enzi, yeah, yeah. So Enzi is one of the, uh, Chris is one of the guys, one of the fellow rollers who appears on one in every dozen episodes. I think he's been on like two or three episodes. He's a Canadian guy and he used to actually cross the border, come down south, um, cross over the wall there and get into the United States. And he would try and qualify for these these big tournaments. And he got his nickname Grinder because he was always fantastic at grinding his way into the final and always coming in, never qualifying. And then he would always make sure somehow he would sneak into the top 16 and he'd be 16th qualified maybe that he was 17th qualified but the 16th guy got you know like the swine flu or something and he managed <laughs> to just somehow miraculously find his way into the top 16 he always do really really well and and sometimes he would uh you know he, he was a bit of a uh, bridesmaid though i think he got a lot of second places in his career um so that's not new and having a really competitive elite final like world championship is not a bad thing in my um, estimation. Where I think uh, what we need to have on the side, just like just like we did in the old days, and I am sure it was just a matter of communication. And as things become clearer, more there'll be like an L five R Winter Court specific announcement. But we need to make sure that on the side there are other events going around. I know that there's like a bit of a festival atmosphere is what people love and certainly going out to Joe Sensors was a hell of a lot of fun and just the general atmosphere that was actually in the um, the FFG Flight Center was so much fun when I, when, when Bert and I went to Worlds it was, and, and Merlin. Uh, it, was, it was just a, a real heap of fun. So I think that as long as there are other tournaments that are running alongside that, whether that be grinders or for those that played in the qualifying tournaments and didn't make it on the day of worlds there's some other fun stuff for them to do uh story based stuff i think that then it can really really work i think the big challenge and it's actually creates a bit more of an atmosphere as well because there'll be a bunch of people that haven't made it through to worlds uh in terms of the world championship event but they are coming and there is some other tournament which has you know that is a, a tournament of note and and you know it does mean you've got a lot more of a spectator it's a lot more elite for spectators it's a lot more interesting and it really does say you know what these national championships continental championships regionals they're all open events and they are going to be the event where you you draw a heap of players and you get to have that great community experience and it's fantastic but they are open by their nature whereas worlds will be ultra competitive and everybody knows if you're going to the world championships which may may be a separate thing from winter court it might just be part of winter court you're there because you're a no lifer um, and for some reason you're prepared to pony up the money to fly to the middle of nowhere and play legend of the five rings to become the best at the world in a game that nobody's heard of <laughs> except for your close circle of friends mm. so I, I am totally cool with making no life activities like legend of the five rings world championships exclusive and now i say that as somebody who is a softy bleeding heart guy do, yeah, no. cool. What what uh, tangible change do you actually see happening in on the day? On the day is round one is the only change. 
round one. It, I think traditionally at, at well not traditionally there's only been two worlds right but in the last two worlds keep in mind like there's no traditional or history here there's been two events so calm down people who say who are status quoing the shit out of this and saying it's always been done like this in my day your day started in 2017 so shut the fuck up um, what I'm saying is the difference is on round one is sometimes you'll luck out and like you you'll get a randomly skilled opponent uh, and they and, and look, one thing I will say, everybody is super friendly at Worlds. It doesn't matter if you're like a no life or competitive player, you're someone who is more casual in nature, or you're someone who just, you know what? I want to make the trip. I want to try my luck. I'm not expecting to go top eight, top 16 or whatever, but I want to try my luck. I really want to throw my hat in the ring. Sometimes there's players who aren't at that super elite level who aren't expecting to get to that top level. Um, and you fight, face one of them in round one. And if you're an ultra competitive player, you get like the simplest round one. You're super happy. Life is good. Um, otherwise, sometimes in round one, you'll get like a really, really hard player. Did- I don't think it makes very much of a difference at all after round yeah, one. Yeah, so, so it doesn't actually make, in terms of like the cut and, and the finals being a competitive game of L5. No difference. No difference. It, no yeah, difference. It, it, it'll, it will either have no difference or it'll be slightly fewer of the best, best players from, from small regions. So that's that's it's, my counter example. Like, what right. if I'm from Italy yep. and I don't have an EC and I can't afford to go... Yeah, yeah I totally... That sucks. Yeah, yeah. I to- totally get that. It does suck. It does suck. I in that regard. And also, cool. that, you know, if if it makes very little difference to the outcome of the tournament itself and the structure at the end, but a bunch less people get to participate, then isn't that not a substantial negative? Yeah, it's dumb. But we've. I okay. think we've said our piece. And I think that you could probably. Yeah, I think we could probably listen to the exhaustive arguments on either side by reading Reddit, Facebook. Discord I suggest no one the do other this, podcasts. by the way. It's just, it's yeah. one of those internet <laughs> screaming matches where there's, you know... Yeah. <laughs> so, let's... And there's so much information we don't have. Cool. All right. So, we did a tight 10, or maybe a loose 10, maybe a loose 11 on on uh, on Worlds, so uh, on OP. So, let's move on from organized play. Uh, we do have a, a fun little segment that we've been throwing around, uh, which we call uh, One Samurai's Trash. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's going to be the title anyway. But we there's there's this idea that we have um, we have this groupthink idea where we've all decided that one card is complete trash, but there's someone who thinks that that card is absolute treasure, that it's an amazing card and it should be played and it has a place in the game, right? And and Toridor is here to tell us that that's absolute bullshit. That's it's shenanigans. Like that card is rubbish and it should go in the bin. But Nathan is one of those guys who loves rummaging around in the bin and he goes, hey, you left this. You left this here, man. It's like it was in a, in a banana peel, but, but you know, and it's and there's like a baked bin tin and I pulled it out of the baked bin tin and it's ready to go. I'm here so, to bring you guys so, down to earth and give you a cold, hard dose of reality. Okay. okay? So, so you're going to give us the dose of reality first and then Nathan's going to have the chance to respond. Butters is going to respond and he's going to go, nah, man, you got it all wrong. So the card of the week today... That, that you believe is trash, but maybe another samurai believes is treasure, is Grasp of the Earth. Why is this card bad? All right, well, first of all, I have to go look it up to read the text again, because I have like um, put that away in my mind as something that is com- not worth looking at. Uh, so I'm just going to read it out for the benefit of all of you other competitively minded people who also chuck this card in the trash when you open up your first core set. Uh, it's a one cost Phoenix attachment, spell Earth, plus one, plus one, decent stats. You know, for a one cost attachment. Attached to a Shigenji you control. Okay, there's the first negative. Uh, action. During conflict, bow this attachment. Opponents, characters cannot move to this conflict or be played from hand until the end of the conflict. Oh, all right. So where do I start? This card's a piece of shit. First of all, uh, attachment. Atta- <laughs> <laughs> the requirements of it being a Shigenji. Easy, that's a minor. Easy. That's a minor thing. Not a big deal. The spell's nice. So um, Shrine Maiden can fetch it. Can't be used with KI, but whatever. Um, the action is actually kind of nice. During conflict battles, attachment opponents' characters cannot move or be played from hand. So the the most important part of that is played from hand, in my opinion. It pairs well with covert, so that you can stop people favorable grounding people in your covert and stuff. Um, so I see the merits of the action. You're, you're, you're big upping it. No, man. no, no. Let, big let me this card. You're not doing a very good job. <laughs> okay, Tell no, me no. more, Bert, about how much this card sucks. Okay, so first of all, your deck is very, very tight in Phoenix. You have a plethora of better spells to choose from. That's argument one. Argument two, 
this is a huge tempo suck sink it's like being stuck in a fucking pit of quicksand because if you play it before the conflict begins your opponent has time to adjust their assignment strategy and their conflict character strategy so they can play it from hand before the conflict begins yada yada if you play it in the middle of the conflict they have a action window to then play their character anyway or play their movement card anyway because of the fact that it's an action not a static effect and that is really the crux of why this card is dog shit it's because it's telegraphed and you don't have the ability to immediately trigger its uh, its text i, I think you disagree i see so f- first of all just a tldr your argument is you didn't know what it did then you read it and the first thing you did was compliment it a few times to say how good the <laughs> abilities were and the stats and the thing it does you're just so you're enough, just fucking right? pulling a donald trump in in the vegas debate against clinton right now this is just stick Look, to the facts don't make mate. me build a wall mate stick to- whoa. <laughs> whoa. Whoa. All right. whoa political guys pull out, pull out. we're going political pull that's out. that that's that plus one coming into play right now Look, it, no, no, in all seriousness, there's so much oh wait 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 can i say game. one more thing before you oh uh, sure yeah, sure yeah, one other do you really negative. like the art another bonus Does, doesn't stop Ninja because put into play is not the same thing carry on doesn't matter doesn't matter one one card out of hundreds upon hundreds can get around it okay so <laughs> <laughs> this card first where you say oh phoenix has struggled playing it it's one influence it can go anywhere like phoenix is a super common splash anyone can do it anyone anyone with it, lots of shigenja no you don't need lot like, anyone that's running enough shugs to run cloud, which is what three different shugs? So you you like got to shut up now, by the way, Bert. Yeah. This is this is uh, yeah. this I've is Butter's time to I've shine. Shut, yeah, this is Butter's your, time to shine. Your incorrect, misinformed mouth. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the, what this card allows you? First of all, as you said, I mean, Bert's taken most of my arguments already. Like the ability is great, the cost isn't that bad, the stats are amazing. I mean, it, the, the biggest argument Bert had, I think, was the tempo shift. And that doesn't matter a lot of the time. I mean, your opponent can play around it, sure, but at that point, all of the stuff they were going to play or move into the conflict loses all its potency. The fact that those cards have to go beforehand means this card's done its job before you even have to activate it. Even if the ability never goes off, one for one one is never bad. It's easy to splash. And the ability itself is obviously where it's amazing. Your person doesn't have to be in there. You can have it on a freaking sinister Soshi offer in the corner if you really want to and just lock down an entire conflict. After you've played this card, then you can bring in additional people and buff your guys or outwit or route or harmonize or any other or um, the Phoenix province where you send someone home and bound that one all of those things can get played and you flick them out of the conflict and they cannot come back nothing can enter the thing again it also helps you with your dishonoring people so unopposed conflicts make your opponent lose honor so you can just lock it down there flick them out of the conflict and start hammering the nail in at the end of a game and all of that i pass en masse turn one and hoard all my fate nonsense that people are routinely doing you know this shuts most of it down they might get one crappy person that you can flick out with any number of cards you drop this and you just get a free break without having to spend many resources and it just persists turn to turn the fact that it's on the table i think is a big enough threat to mean it it's always going to be there i mean and let's say it gets nuked by let go or something well that's great now they're not going to let go your other stuff if this is on the table the the true test of a card's worth when it's an attachment is whether or not your opponent burns a let go on it and i reckon this would be a target mic drops there you go so is this <laughs> <you've> said, <laughs> but is, is this the red herring uh, attachment in your deck that you're trying to get your opponent to use let go on what no they i hope they don't because then they'll suffer the consequences <laughs> <laughs> what I love about Butters is that his, the cards that he used as an argument to pair with this card were Outwit and Harmonize. <laughs> and, and Route? And Route, oh, yeah. Mate, oh, yeah. That, they would, those route, two will be coming in numbers. future episodes, don't you worry. <laughs> so I think, I feel we'll, like make, I think actually... we'll make Outwit and Route a double feature, actually, <laughs> given they're so similar. <laughs> I feel like we can run City of Liars and just reduce the cost of those cards. It'd be amazing. All right. That was that was. I'm convinced. Grasp the earth is a That's card God coming to a trophy. I, I need Jay on here or someone with a fucking you know negative pessimistic brain to, to back me up on this. Nah, nah. Remedy's got my back. We we discussed this card at length. It's, it's great. He was dismayed and disappointed. He was shocked 
that it didn't get played. He's like, why? Why does this card not get played more? It's amazing. It's like, I know, Glenn. I know. Ask Bert. He's the poison master. He'll fucking taint the community. Anyway. All right. So Play it, everyone. So, great. <laughs> well done. All right. So over the last week, there has been an incredibly large amount of tournaments played. And this weekend as well, there is even more and more tournaments to be played that are big ones. And I mean, elemental championships. I love it. There's There's been a heap of elemental championships and there's been a bunch of results which are really, really interesting and surprising. Uh, there will be a link in the podcast description. If you want to have a look at some statistics, I would suggest you go check out those statistics because um, I've put together a spreadsheet uh, and it's available on the winners event winners uh uh big list that we're also maintaining there's a link there that says lots more stats check it out just click that link and you'll see some really cool little results um but let's just go over who's been winning right so since uh last week we've had a whole bunch so first of all we had uh gabriel oh, actually no gabriel katan we didn't talk about last week he won with dragon and an original splash of crab uh, and that was in uh, Seminole, Florida. Then we had Tim Scarrow from Omaha, Nebraska. He won his EC Championship with Drag Dragon, and he was seems like he checked out Gabriel and went, hmm, maybe I should try splashing Crab in my Dragon. And he splashed Crab in his Dragon deck. Uh, we had Glenn Bosa from Chicago, Illinois, with the Phoenix Dragon combo. Uh, we had Dennis Murphy, a.k.a. Isomalt, take out uh, Portland, Oregon. And, Did he uh, win Portland? We might be here. He did, no mate. He shit. got there. Well done, Dennis. He got there. It's a tough field too, Portland. Yeah. Uh, it was a pretty stacked field, and we might be hearing from those Portland boys pretty soon, actually. Uh, he actually won in a crane mirror against uh, Jesse Butler, who's another strong crane player. Yeah. So it's um, so it was. I mean, that that field it was it was actually like only a fifteen player tournament. But if you look, there's like Mosey, so and there's just like a lot it's of like world's strong World's players, 2019 yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah, fifteen players, yeah, yeah, all, yeah, the, yeah. all the most competitive beasts. Yeah. yeah. Um, we did have some Canadian tournaments. Well, we had uh, two Canadian tournaments, actually. Vancouver in, in uh, British BC. Uh, Rudy Cari- Carico or Caricho. He won with Unicorn and Phoenix Splash. Uh, so that was a pretty cool deck. Uh, is Again, we're seeing that um, the deck was fairly similar to uh, what Frotop put on his... Um, actually, it's not at all. I apologize. Nothing to do with Frotop's deck uh his unicorn deck that he put on the primer video this is a guy showing you how powerful unicorn is he won this ec and it was a decent sized ac he was splashing one against the waves and three display of powers Oof. he had mantis tech and ninja in his deck three copies of it you know he was he was oh, wait, making so some seeker players, of like water the- then if he's using the tank ninja that's crazy yeah seeker yeah. of water man so seeker up, of water giving up unleash the gin and keeper initiates yeah th- it's got 3x press of battle in there too, man. Like That's a pretty serious deck. And it's showing you that Unicorn can actually win with all sorts of different decks, right? That's really cool. I've been playing a bit of Unicorn because yeah. I've been... Uh, I selected them for my Season 13 um, Discord League. Man. Well, they're just lying. Oh, yeah. They can win, right? Like, yeah. They're, they yeah. The <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is sad, but true. Yeah. Uh, so we then had Stephen Allen playing the more tradi- the more uh, conservative Phoenix with Dragon Splash, uh, just making sure that he could get those. And that was in uh, in uh, Atlanta. Oh, cool. So that was uh, a decently. That was actually quite a decently attended uh, elemental championship as well. Uh, and then we had uh, Darren Hazelden who won with Dragon uh, over in in Bassingstoke in the United Kingdom uh, that was with Dragon and he chose uh, another unusual splash crab for his Dragon deck and then finally we had uh, Ronnie so Ronnie is actually the player of 2019 at the moment he's recorded two premium event wins which is the two ECs uh, two, two of the Canadian ECs one in uh, Toronto and the other in Petersburg uh, oh sorry Peterborough Petersburg and t- sorry Canadians Canada, out there Canada's it's quite a competitive uh, meta from, from what a competitive I've field yeah, yeah. And he's been running Scorpion Splash uh, as well. Um, so mm-hmm, he's mm-hmm. on those stats it. there. You can start to see, yeah. So so Suzatron he is on Discord for those of you who are unlucky enough to face him in those tournaments. Uh, I'd just like to say, Bert, that the latest deck that he was running at this uh, this um, uh, latest Elemental Championship, his splash was Scorpion. I'm going to read out his splash for you. Three times Mark of Shame. Three. So far, seems pretty good. That's a lot. Three marker shapes. Yeah, continue. All right. He's 
He's running one Bayushi Collector. Ooh. Then he's got and then he's got another two influence card that started to become super popular in Scorpion. Like, what do you think if in terms of two influence Scorpion splash cards that just seem to make sense that you should they're a staple and you should really no no the, no 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 I'm talking about a card that really should be in every deck. Really you know, exciting. if you could squeeze it in, you should put it in every Maze deck. Maze of Illusion, of course. Why, how could I forget? Yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. Maze is, is definitely a good good guess, but I'm talking about a card that really you've actually come into uh, come a cropper. You've had some real challenges against this oh, card you're recently. Fucking kidding. He didn't play Yoga Kick. He certainly did. <laughs> yes. Ronnie, you fucking savage, dude. That's disgusting. Well done. He played a Yogo Kikio. Two of them. So, one. like, he played one Yogo Kikio. It's so, even it was more three Marcus Shames. In Crane, because it's... you've already got a lot of native cancels. It's even more, you know, egregious. Warren. Because <laughs> he's, he's running, like, cancel wise. He's got Kikio, he's got one censure, three voices of honor. He's, it was a spicy meter ball of deck. He's got an I Can Swim in there, two calling in favors. He's got a peasant's advice. Like, this is a deck that's got pieces. Now, I, I just want to. I know that Suzatron is an amazing player and he's put up tons of results, but as a disclaimer. The reason that Ben is, is pretty high on this guy is not only because he's the, the winningest player for the 2019 season of premium events, <laughs> but he did knock him out of Worlds. So the more he could puff him up, the better it makes him confident. <laughs> <laughs> you might be on to me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's at the top of my list of top ringers on the uh, the competitive stats charts for 2019. I'd just like to make a shout uh, out quickly to you, Simkoff, for putting together those stats. They are fucking amazing. And I suggest anyone who's into stats, even even has a cursory interest in statistics and loves all 5 r to check him out. There's, there's all the events from all over the world being reported to that document, which is really sweet. Nice. Yeah, Elemental Championships, Codes, Grand Codes, Barbecues, Cookouts. Um, we've got the clan scorecard as well is quite interesting that I kind of put together. For 2019 so far, in terms of ECs and above, there's been five Phoenix wins and five Dragon wins. So they're, wow. they're like on... Phoenix is on top of the table, right? Mm. Then you've got three Unicorn, three Crab, three Crane, and then there's just zero results for Scorpion or uh, the Lost Clan. Like, it's, <laughs> it's pretty... Pretty pretty crazy to think that scorpion is just n it, it hasn't even registered yet like it's there's weird. been 19 19 ec and above grade tournaments and, and well there actually there's been 20 there was an ec in shanghai if anyone is a shanghai listener out there there's probably zero of you but if there happens to be there was a uh ch elemental championship that apparently happened out there but i don't know the results for it but like scorpion have not even just registered, goes to show just how much the whole identity of that clan uh, in, in its success anyway was tied into that card of fate worse than death because other Bruno clans Longo? other clans <laughs> other <laughs> clans also took hits right like dragon took a big hit and i think rather than them being like clearly top dog i think it is kind of neck and neck with phoenix now and and crane took a hit they lost guests to the restricted list and other clans took and hits fate worse than death yeah <laughs> but um fate worse than death was such a a archetype defining card that they have slid so far yeah. it's crazy i mean we predicted it when the restricted list landed we all sort of said oh it's the end of scorp for now anyway i think do i think though fate though stood alone like it was it, it there was no other card in fate's wheelhouse that did that kind of stuff there are big cards but they all sort of bring a bunch of people onto the table nothing just had a massive impact you like mean that, conflict side that heavily yeah, yeah yeah like obviously you know you've got all champions and stuff but you're on your conflict side like, there are no other cards like fate worse than death i think void fist is the only I close think... one and that one also got restricted so well i don't think yeah even void fist i think is not not as as bad but um don't get me wrong it's still a savage card but at the same time um i think fate worse than death was just the was the primary reason scorpion could play the way they could they played totally totally agree to totally other agree. decks it was the it was and the the worst thing that they could have done to scorpion yeah well no, see uh, maybe it's just you, you sort of want everyone to be playing the same base game and if they're gonna be different it needs to be because of a collection of cards not just one enormous hammer right so i i get it um i just i resent it i suppose <laughs> <laughs> i understand i don't have to like it i think at the top level i think most competitive players kind of agreed that it wasn't actually for balance purposes it was because they wanted to shelf scorpion for a bit and and eliminate that style of play as like a winning strategy 
because it was a bit NPE. Yeah. Let's be honest. Like, if you're a casual player and you come up against Sim Cough at Worlds and he's playing Five Fires, Kachiko, and Fate Worse and Death, and you haven't played against that deck before, you're gonna have a bad time, you know? Yeah, yeah it's, not it's hard fun. to have a good time when you've got no people on the table <laughs> that can do anything. Um. So one of the other things I've put together just from a competitive standpoint, I think it's fun to track this stuff. It doesn't mean a lot, but it's just fun to track it, is um, that that stat sheet, which you can have a look at, it, there's kind of two sheets. One's 2019 based, um, and the other one is all time. And you can there's filters you can kind of change by a restricted list or look by country or event type, etc. But if you just go unfiltered all time, I've created a list, and we actually added the uh, global Discord uh uh, cup winners as well uh, to it so there's like a global so it's tracking worlds grand cotes global discord leagues cotes and elemental championships all time um, we can actually see that uh, Anil to no surprise and Jacob are like one and two um, and then there's a really thick pack which is from like three to seven of there's actually only been seven players that have that are at least of results I'm aware of um, that uh, have recorded more than one uh, premium event win so we have uh, Anil Jacob uh, Jacob Ertzk who I think last year you know we definitely um, saw him just you know he won three grand cotes and one cote how absurd is that what an absurd record I, I played against him <laughs> at Worlds in the side of the proving grounds the following day and I was just absolutely yeah. knackered. Like I'd played ten games of L five R or whatever, and he was playing like a robot yeah. and just destroyed me. He's he's an absolute <laughs> machine. Yeah, he's it's absurd, right? And then you've got Jared Wright, aka Mosey. He's on two wins, and like Mosey is he's he's a he's a beast. Uh, we've got Chris Podoff, aka Sir Largeness, on two wins. Palumbo is on Steve Palumbo is on two wins. Uh, he's got like three different names online. I think uh, Synergy is one of them, but Palumbo is an amazing player. Widewin with two wins, and I think it's good to actually show Widewin with two wins there, which are the Discord League wins, because those are like. Yeah, you know, multi- sometimes they're like 200 players, but they're usually at least 150 players. Like, they're stacked fields, right? Like, I don't think anybody can really say that a global Discord League win is an easy thing to come by. Like, there's some pretty... You've, you've played in a few, Toto. I think you even got second once. Like, would you describe that as a cakewalk of a tournament? No, it's, it's just the format's just different. I think... I don't like drawing a big distinction between them and live events, but I think they are different. But I do think it's very competitive yeah. and tough. And so you play from the comfort of your own home. There are no rounds. You don't have to like play. It's not an attrition game or anything. But each individual match is incredibly uh, tough, especially in that cup. You, there are no easy games or anything. It's really, really hard. No. You're running chess so, uh, I don't know if they time wise. I don't know if they not do. chess box. They did for the World Cup, but um, I think it was just a trial. Yeah. So. What are you running yeah. when you're running chess clocks and those things like for World Cup? 45 well, for the Australian Discord League, it was 45, yeah. But I yeah, think yeah. you could probably do 30. Like, there are, there's this lag time where neither clock runs down for yeah. framework stuff, so. Mm. Okay. Um, nice. Yeah. And then, yeah, so Ronnie's obviously uh, on seven. Uh, he's, he's ranked seventh of all time, but first for 2019 with these two so ACs. Out the gates, uh, crushing. Crushing souls, and mate. Here's here's the player of 2019 so far. If there was player of the year points, he's got the player of the year points. Dude, that's right? your next job, so, dude. Make the player of the year points. Player of the year. Actually, you know what? Let's announce it right now. We're having a Hidden City Roller sponsored player of the year. I don't know the prizes, but it's going to be based on the points that are on these stats, and we're going to send out some cool prizes for player of the year in the top something. We'll figure and it we'll out. Interview that person. Signed, the the assigned by the entire cast of Rollers copy of Grasp of Earth. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out and we'll announce it um but yeah let's do it we've got the statistics to prove it all we need to do is keep this goddamn thing up there upgraded apologies to the religious folk out there for blaspheming um right <laughs> we do have <laughs> on that note there uh speaking of the listeners is we've got uh it's been quite fantastic actually since we've opened up our facebook page a little bit started posting a little bit more we've got our twitters and discords and we've tried to like engage more and more questions are starting to come in and uh ray dent if you're out there and we're listening uh we miss you there was no okay. question posted Number this week <laughs> man ray dent we need you back I'm, t- I'm asking you now you need a question next week i'll be very disappointed if there's not a question but for uh for your record is blemished 
for now, let's let's look through some of these questions and see if we can't solve some listener problems. Um, right. Edwin Pierce, who, who's asked a few questions in the past, he's, he said, this is a good one. I think um, I was actually talking to... His question is, Phoenix seemed to have momentum of a runaway freight train. Why are they suddenly so popular? Uh I was actually talking to um, Eaton, Andrew, who's a uh, old friend of Butters and myself uh, today. He's, uh, he's actually talking about experimenting with Phoenix at the moment, and he says the clan just seems to have so many options, and he's very excited about them. Um, have either of you seen Phoenix in action, and, and why do you think suddenly they are on top of the tables in terms of most wins at these premium tournaments, and people seem to be having a lot of success? Well, I think the answer is clearly grasp of earth. Um, do you have anything else yeah. to add, Butters, or...? Well, that's that's the whole deck, right? I mean, <laughs> you start with three of copies of Grasp it's, of Earth yeah. and then build around it. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. No, Grasp of Earth is is the be all. It's actually got a better home in Dragon because they've got two cards that can fetch Grasp of Earth and, and dig for it, and you can play Shrine Light to dig for it as well. <laughs> so you're like guaranteed Grasp every turn. I play a bit of Phoenix. So is illustrious. Is illustrious Forge a card that Phoenix players are looking out to, so they can get access to that Grasp of Earth quicker? With that, that new province, the reaction, look at the top five of your cards and then equip a Grasp of the Earth for free. I feel like it's an auto-include. Yeah, fair call. Now, but you've got probably Phoenix. a slightly different opinion. Yeah, I like... Yeah, what do you reckon? I've been playing the, like, the good stuff Dragon Splash deck a bit, and I've also played a bit of the old box Keeper deck with Backhanders and Tariagize and um, Three Mazes and all that. that. That deck is probably my favorite deck to play, period right now i just love playing it every time i play it. it's super fun but i think that their deck ha- didn't really get hit by the restricted list their, their tier one deck so if you're talking about competitive play the deck really didn't take any hits and decks like dragon and scorpion came down a peg and i think scorp was one of the worst matchups for phoenix and so them being kind of an irrelevant mm. uh, faction to deal with now has you know shot them up a bit i also think that they don't have weaknesses so they've got six against the waves to deal with opponents against the waves bowing their shugs um, they've got board clear with five fires, which has become like a bit of a backup plan for that deck. Um, so if you're losing on board or if you're maintaining a parity, but you're a little bit behind, you can play that card and just and just turn the game. And then just the tempo, the tempo of their cards is quite quick. They've got uh, the recursion, shrine maiden, um, and and also I think they're fun and they're fast, they're aggressive, and so I think people like playing that yeah. style. So that's why I think they're popular yeah, for sure. I think the the recursion on Cute Nissa, I think, is the big reason. Um, that's yeah, their strongholds just on. better than than the others. It's except bonkers for and City. and obviously probably the I'd say top dog as far as personalities go in the game at the moment is Tadaka. Like he just ruins lives when he hits the table. Um, he controls everything. Like your opponent can no longer cancel the rest of your events for the most part. They can't play half their hand. Um, and Phoenix have just got, you know, they've got the Forgotten Libraries, which I think arguably is, arguably is the the best holding in the game that's not a one-off. I agree with um, that. I think it's the best holding in the game that's not a one-off. It's just, it's super amazing. Oh, maybe, maybe Iron Mine would, would contest, but I, I still would probably go with the library. Um, but at, again, yeah, they've just got so many tools that other clans struggle to include. Like they can run that full shug deck, which is obviously Phoenix's jam, but against the waves is super good, particularly when you can use recursion. They've also got the supernatural storm, which is just a huge boost. Most of the time they'll have a few guys on the table that just ruin your life. Um, and they've got a lot of little spells that they can toss in the deck, just one of like karmic twist or consumed or any another of any other number of spells yeah. that they can just recur later on should they need them. So they've got this. The longer the game goes. I suppose that's the big thing for me with Phoenix. The longer the game goes, the h- less likely you are to beat them. And because the, their, their options in the discard get bigger and your options get smaller as you play more events and Tadaka, crush, Tadaka crushes you. And I think that's... Yeah, I think the one card, if you wanted to really nerf Phoenix, would be to restrict Supernatural Storm. I think that would be the card that, paired with Tadaka being restricted, would be the biggest band hammer you could do to them but I, I like you know they haven't won any major events prior to 2019 and I, i've always mm. thought that they're a very interesting deck to play and to play against so i'm happy that they're yeah. doing well and you know Tadaka's is a bit of a shame because i really hate playing against that guy or with him to be fair um and with with a lot of the big kill clan being kind of nerfed he's even stronger yeah. so you can do stuff like um walking the way to get him and stuff um as well yeah. 
I think um I think Phoenix have taken the the massive tower spot that Dragon did. Like Dragon can still do it, obviously, but Phoenix do it just as well now. Dude, what about like, the exquisite yeah. pain of having your opponent play a consumed by five fires for free because they've put embrace the voids in your characters? That if you haven't ha- <laughs> yeah. felt that, that is pure pain. <laughs> pure pain, boys and girls. It's just so good. But I mean, they've just got so much value out of one person as well. They can tower up something and they've got against the waves. Again, that card is super key, but also um, the name escapes me right now where you don't bow in a conflict and don't bow as a result of political conflicts. Oh, clarity of purpose. Yeah. Clarity of purpose is another amazing And they've just got good weenies. Three of. Their one drops are really strong. They have real good little people. Like the Solemn Scholar is ball, is just baller. It's ridiculous. The um, um, Ethereal Dreamer was a big boost. It's a really yep, strong huge, card. Huge, yeah. three. It's just a way better version of the Angry Shigenja from Dragon. But if you haven't played much um, Phoenix listeners, go out and play some. They're really, really fun. Yeah, for sure. Get, cool. get into that right. grasp of Earth. <laughs> Melissa Marsh uh, has, a, has a request for a shout out, which we're always happy to do. Uh, Sydney uh, in New South Wales, Australia. Uh, their Good Game store, which is actually it's in top right. For some reason, she says City Good Games, but it's in Top Ride. Top Ride's a little bit north uh, of, of, of Sydney. Is They are having their Stronghold League. It's about to begin uh, Friday night, so probably the day that you hear this podcast, Australians, um, when you're listening to this, head up, head up to Top Ride and enjoy some Stronghold League action at Good Games. She has uh, uh, and procured it. some custom cards for promos, which look really sweet, so check that out. Nice. And, and there's also going to be some streaming, so... Um, watch the streaming <laughs> um, cool all right so then okay here's a great question Eric Hyden hey hey Eric how's it going man um, he's asked what is a cool new kind of deck the world has never seen before that we will get to see post coat children of the Empire what do you guys reckon what's something new that we've never seen before a straight jeweler's deck is the the obvious boring answer um, and I, I dare say I think they'll probably do quite well um not necessarily as a result of the jewels but as a result of all the effects that will trigger off your jewels i think crane honor will i think a crane honor dueling deck is is probably going to be the first semi-reliable um honor deck basically and on a maybe not on a running deck but they'll engage you in conflict they'll slam around all kinds of juicy events and um it, that will it'd be kind of cool if you make jewels with the crane deck where your opponent can either choose between winning the duel and donating you honor so that you're closer to your victory condition or they, they surrender the duel. I think if they can strike that balance well, that'd be cool. I think that dueling thing's really going to get strong with the crane box. But um, I think for Coat, I reckon perhaps the hardest hard control deck we've ever seen with like Old Box Phoenix and the Emperor. I think that might be an archetype <laughs> that works. I'm serious. That, because that card is clearly just... Wait, so you're going to have Tadaka in that deck as well, right? Yeah, you get Tadaka as well. If you choose that as your restriction, so you just card, have presumably you'd probably choose that. Wow! So you just you just com- you lock Kanto. them down so amazingly hard <laughs> and Kanto. Oh my god! <laughs> it's just like the ultimate. You are not allowed to do anything, Dave. And I think um, I tell you what, up tier one yeah. unicorn is the other thing. Just fast, strong, yeah. aggressive unicorn. Yeah, that would be. I think cool. Phoenix deck though. Because you can't do anything, right? You got Kanjo blowing and stuff, <laughs> Grasp of Earth. You can't move into conflicts. Marwin's listening to this just, podcast, yeah. just having a bat, just so excited for this deck. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, I think that one thing that we will start to see, or well, what I'm, what I think, I'm making a bold claim now, is I think we're going to see the rise of the lion splash. I think with hand to hand becoming a card that can potentially deal with nasty attachments like watch commander um then i think that and i think that lion as a splash has been generally a hobby it's something people do for fun and i mean there's been a very occasional deck that goes you know what let's make use of strength of my ancestors and in phoenix and do some really funky like force pumps but in general like it's 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 considered an acquired taste the lion splash but i think now that they have some attachment control available to them we'll see more and more people experiment with lion splash agreed yeah. Yeah. i mean it's whether it's dis- be effective or not it's pretty depressing that that 
you know, using yellow cards is going to be a new and interesting build that no one has ever seen before. <laughs> I think it's kind of horrible. But, okay, well, you know. I do. I do have another. I do have another bold prediction, which my uh, fellow scorpions, generally speaking, disagree with. Um, yes. Dynasty phase scorpions. So this idea of scorpions playing the dynasty phase, I think that we will start to see with lots of interesting abilities being printed on scorpion characters, more and more scorpions will actually put fate on their characters. It's something that um, me as a bit of a diehard scorpion, um, I kind of throw my nose up at and think that why, why I don't understand why you'll put fate on a character that's not uh, called Boyushi right. Kachiko actually, or on turn I, turn I five with Boyushi Jojo. They're not doing that, Ben. They're not doing that because they can't play characters during the conflict into the conflict do you want to tell us why <laughs> uh, it's, it's the grass of the earth meta we're just it living is. in it it's defining this season you know there are right, there are gullible the vulnerable souls out there listening to this cast looking for legitimate competitive advice and you guys are just polluting the minds of the youth I, with that I look forward to being credited with some of the kudos when they take out worlds <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, so the great Barry Shepherd asks. So, new organized play. Um, I think we've covered that, Barry. Thanks again for uh, all the hard work you do. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we're uh, we've covered that already. So hopefully, hopefully, it lived up to your standards. Um, Joseph Raymond Martin. Uh, actually, he's asked a question, guys. We, we'll entertain one of these types of questions, but try to try to like elevate the sort of questions you ask. <laughs> he said. Um, if you could be a potato, what kind of potato would you be? I'm not exactly sure why he asked this question, but uh, has anyone got any amazing insight on potatoology? Well, I've never thought about this before, but I'm just thinking about it. Really? Now. That's amazing. You've never thought about what sort of potato you would be if you were a potato. <laughs> that shocks me. That shocks me, really. <laughs> I, I, I think, think about you a whole different way now. Is he trying to insult us? I don't know. What is it's, even happening here? Like... <laughs> <laughs> I would probably be a what sweet potato, potato? Cause I'm a sweet Who potato. am I? What are we even doing? No, Bert, in his inherently contrary nature, is the potato. <laughs> ah! Because <laughs> potatoes have been nerfed, right? Potatoes is where it's at. That's right, absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm going to say a sweet potato because my wife prefers sweet potatoes. And I'm a good boy. Yes. <laughs> I'm a generic brown spud. <laughs> brown spud <laughs> generic brown spud straight out of the earth <laughs> alright uh, sh- uh, uh, we do have a, a final answer for you Bert or are we going to move on I was going to say sweet potato because I'm a sweet boy uh, that's good Negative. I like it <laughs> alright Schrodes Daniel Schro- Schrodinger sorry Schroeder um, he says way too early for predictions for clan posts uh, for clan rankings post COTE question mark is it too early to predict oh, which clans are going to be on top of the table I think so nah, anyone no. I think it's too yeah. early like, are you wait wait I, I, come on but this should be your what, opportunity what? Oh, you I, to stand up and, and make a bold claim and a bet that you're not going to follow through on when you lose right. it post oh, yeah. post coat unicorn will be top dog and it won't be close they're going to smash everyone that'll stick for a while too because then it's the unicorn pack only a month after presumably so they'll just maintain some some savage strength I think they're already possible. I think they just people for for reasons we all know and understand. People have aren't as practiced with unicorn as they are with the other clans because <laughs> they had a, a rough trot a rough trot early on. Maybe didn't get enough reps, but um, nah, they've got some some crazy like unicorn have always had amazing conflict side. Like it's always been great and it's always been a massive splash. But the dynasty is now getting taken up to the is, same is level. Kamoko and, and char- is Kamoko in charge? Children of the Empire. I feel um, like Kamoko is the unicorn pack. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, she's unicorn. But they've still got good people. Yeah, dude, it's looking scary. I'm excited. Yeah, isn't their their little two cost of duelist is a harpoon, right? Oh, so I've good. I've been playing that, a lot that. of unicorn for this current league, and they're so much fun. I've won, I've won three games, and every game has been on a total knife edge where I just exploded at the right time to win to seize victory. They do get a new 
they do get a new box as well. So I think one of the exciting things about Unicorn is, is that um, there's going to be a couple of different archetypes. You've got this like yep. big fate hoarding. Well, it's not necessarily fate hoarding, but fate generating. Maybe you're spending it as fast as you're generating it version of the deck. Then you've got a potentially super aggro version with HMT and you've got your like curved blades, your Gaijin scum going at it and beating the hell out of people as fast as you can. But they've also got all of these cards that nobody's really sure yet whether they're going to be great or they're going to be binder fodder and I think that honest challenge of the harpoon duelist is a great example of that who's a two coster and generally speaking two costers have to have very very strong abilities to uh, to start being included in decks because they're assassinatable so you want to spend as little fate as possible on them so generally you love your one costers for that reason one costers that have good abilities go there um, so they're not three costers so they're two costers it means you don't want to invest fate so it's kind of a tricky spot to be in um, so I guess time will tell to see how strong that card will be. I'm just so excited to test the new shit, man. It's going to be so much fun. Yeah. And there's so much of it as well. Like, I feel like every single clan can get a complete flip and just run a completely different feeling deck. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so uh, we do have... Oh, yeah, there's one. Was a question from Okoto Yama, a.k.a. The Cat Herder one who hurts cats says uh how much has the changes to worlds affected the australian community and if anything what would you like to see happen to keep worlds interesting for the rest of the actual worlds so there's two questions there first of all uh bert you might want to cover this one how is how has these changes to world affected the australian community i think it's it's well we don't have knowledge of what actual events we're getting we do know we're getting three ecs in melbourne that's been under the table confirmed to us um good to announce that publicly bert all oh, right. That we we may or may not know that knowledge. I might edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's restart. Um, Akoto Yama asks, how much changes to worlds affected the Australian community? And if anything, would you like to see uh, see happen to keep worlds interesting for the rest of the actual world? So there's two questions here. Um, firstly, uh, how much has the change to the worlds affected the Australian community? But um, I think probably very little because majority of us didn't go right. So there's only a few of us that went over. Um, yeah, it was like three people. Yeah, I think. We don't know what sort of events we're going to get yet that could qualify us locally. So it might take additional travel, which would be very, very tough um, to, as a selling point. Um, so probably not much difference, but maybe a couple people that want to go won't get to go. Uh, and then the second part, um, keeping worlds interesting for the rest of the actual world, maybe have an event in every reasonably sized meta where the first place finisher gets a flight because that would be pretty cool. And then you could have like an emissary from each place. <laughs> Um, or I just like the yeah. streaming, keep the streams up and stuff. So. Um, I, think, I do think that the, yeah, go for it. I was just going to say, I think um, community-wise over here, I feel like even though you're right, only three people went last year, but everyone would want to go. And I feel like having the changes to the OP mean that that's much less of an option period now to go and do that. I think it's going to have an effect to the potential for buzz at bigger tournaments and the like. Like, I don't think it's going to get more people there. I think you're likely to get less. Like, oh, well, the odds of me winning and taking it out and getting a part of that community are far less now. So there's, you know, why bother to stay and do my locals? Um, to improve it, look, I think uh, just for Australia, I think um, an emphasis on more events in each location. I think a bit of um, being on the West Coast where there's like no cities anywhere near me. I think the closest city is like 3,000 kilometers away um so people here it's hard to get a decent event run like we don't i think have ecs or cotes or anything like i think australia as a whole though needs a cote to run i think you may you may get a state championship critical. though now man well now yeah, that we have these know, tiered events now that we've got these tiered events national championships state championships i feel like i feel like there's a decent i don't see why western australia wouldn't get a state championship like it's almost as big as texas right like it's a ridiculously large state like, come on, geography is going to count for something. <laughs> that does it though? It hasn't in the past. That is true. What it, what it counts true. for is shipping costs. But yeah, yeah. No, that's my piece. So. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, Thank you. Cool. Yeah, dig it. All right, uh, and and uh, yeah. So there is one final question from. Our friend Trogdor Jones. So if you would like to change one thing about L5R, a card, gameplay, etc., what would it be? Ooh, that's a good question. One thing about L5R, fuck. Um, I... One thing is, is hard. I feel like the... It's simultaneous the strength of the game and what I would change. I think 
the strength of the game is that it's so complex and there's so many moving parts to think about and so much planning that it makes it such an awesome competitive game at the same time i think all of that stuff together is the barrier to newer players and that's why its growth has been so slow um and i think it's a barrier to letting the game get really huge and which is what i'd love to see i'd love to see mad growth for it i think there's plenty of mechanics in the game since its creation that are just unnecessary like i don't think the imperial favor really has to be there as a core mechanic the ring thing probably doesn't have to happen um yeah there you go actually one thing i think to make it simple i would like just every deck to be able to pick whichever ring and roll they want that i think that'd be cool for, for deck construction i Birdie? that's a really tough question um man that's just really hard i don't i don't know if there's any one thing that that would be like a silver bullet to make the game so much better or anything but i would like to experiment with removing passing fate um because as far as i understand it the only benefit to it right now is that it's a mini game that rewards planning and there's a bit of a jockeying for position in dynasty phase but i would just like to see what would happen if if we remove that benefit and then because i think right now i still think that white going wide isn't rewarded very much and so that would be it's, one I've, way to to maybe yeah level it a bit. i'm inclined to agree i've been playing a lot of decks lately like my cheaper nasty and i've been playing a lot of lion with hordes and crab hordes and oh every turn i'll dump almost my entire row before we hit the the draw phase and it really doesn't feel like i'm getting much out of that like at all like it, they can have one person on the table play a couple of cards and having numbers on the board doesn't seem to make much difference at all so that's i think you might be right getting rid of that passing fate and encouraging people to to get stuck in i think it'd be a really good idea i mean that's one of those extra mechanics that the game probably just doesn't need i would also set fire to katsuki investigator just ban it um now my obvious choice is to remove watch commander but for the sake of this uh, thought experiment <laughs> we'll say i get another option what i would very much love to see would be you have um satori and uh, daisetsu who are the two um assuming i got those names correct i'm pretty sure i did they're the two children of the emperor uh, of of uh, jodan do you know jodan is the name of our emperor oh i did not know spoiler that. now i do well, there you awesome. go. so just for All clarity right. for everybody and our listeners daisetsu is scumbag child and satori is golden child satori is the yeah so so daisetsu is the the brat uh oldest child and the emperor has uh jodan has told Taturi to go and issue an edict to say that unlike any other time in the history of rockigan uh for his secession when he steps down as the emperor which he wants to do asap uh satori who is his second child uh second son will actually take over and Taturi has yet to deliver that edict he's been quite tardy with it um but uh that's that's the plan so i would love to see those two characters there there was a time in legend of the five rings that i think that would be amazing if we could take some um take some inspiration from not do it exactly the same way but uh, of course because you want it to be a new game and have new fun stuff in gold edition the idea of gold edition taturi who is the greatest character that has ever existed in the entirety of the legend of the five rings he toku, was toku. <laughs> i toku toku to be fair but um and toku was under the tutelage of taturi so hey oh, okay. but anyway taturi was um he was the emperor and he had ascended he was a spirit and he was ascending to the spirit realm and he left behind with him four children technically there was a fifth you can read into the lore if you want to but you know anyway there's four children and each of those was essentially called a win so throughout the entirety of gold edition which is a big story arc of old school legend of the five rings every clan attached a wind to their stronghold and a wind gave you represented there was four wins and they each represented one of the children and they gave you certain mechanical abilities they basically changed the way that the imperial favor works for you depending on which child you supported for the throne the whole arc was about which of those four children would ascend to become the emperor the new emperor right um and the great thing was that each of those four wins your deck you could kind of choose whichever four wins you want and it would it would change the theme of your deck and people would start lobbying and you would get behind you know a particular child so if you could do something similar to that idea i think where um you know because votes were taken so whenever you won a tournament you had to say hey i supported you know today i supported this wind i supported that wind so the idea that you know the 
primary sort of the catalyst for the plot for this year seems to be this you know these two children fighting for who's going to be the next emperor when when Jodan steps down um, I like the idea that there's going to be like a Rokugani civil war factions are going to be fighting against each other different clans are going to align with different um, children and I like the idea that there's some internal squabbling amongst the clans of which child they should present and that should be displayed in a numeric in a sort of a uh, mechanical fashion that's my thoughts anyway so i love how in true simcoff fashion after i've just said i think the best thing of the game would be to simplify it a little bit you go nah nah mate more <laughs> Add mechanics, mechanics. Add mechanic. let's chuck in more shit <laughs> extra choices more mechanics build them up <laughs> chuck them all in there roll cards let's put some senseis in there too while we're at it and what about ancestors. some mini games like you put your jewel but instead of a real jewel you play a game of magic the gathering halfway through. <laughs> the winner of that wins the jewel yeah that's it well anyway i hope you enjoyed our episode tonight uh we are a little bit uh longer than usual uh but it was you know we did miss last week uh we've got some pretty cool stuff coming up for next week uh i'll just tease it a little bit we're going to be there are some interviews happening with some international guests international men of mystery um that you will get to meet uh next week so until then uh any any last words all. No, uh, restrict grass of earth. People. Also. No, all restrict. people play grasp of earth. <laughs> play cool. it before right. it gets restricted. Cool. Okay. Well, until until next time, everybody, keep on rolling. You can now press stop. That was really good. <laughs>